Good morning, my excellent friends. It is so good to be back with you guys. So good to be back. But before I go on, before I go any further, can we just thank everyone who helped out, who filled in, uh, who held down the fort while Pete and I were away? And they say, Lauren, Mrs. J, Stephanie, Al, Zeke, Emily, Beth, Zippy. Uh, Kaylee, Dr. J, Chuck, uh, Zane was filling in on the lights I heard. Uh, so just, yeah, just give them, one more time, give them a big round of applause and let them know, yeah, let's let them know how much we appreciate what they did. It was not an easy thing. And they did an amazing job, okay, despite a little bit of excitement that I heard about. Okay. So big, big thank yous to all of them. Great job, guys. Thank you guys so much. Okay. I miss you guys. It felt weird not to be here last week. But see, that's a good thing. Okay? That's, that's how I should feel. It should feel off to me when I'm not amongst my brothers and sisters. It should feel off when I'm usually in a place filled with the Holy Spirit, and for whatever reason, I'm not. Okay? Pascal said that there, there's a God-shaped hole in each and every one of us, and only God can fill it. So, when I missed out on being in a place where God is, it should feel like that hole is there. Now, I joined you guys by internet, but man, it is not the same. So I can truly say with gladness in my heart this morning, it's good to be home. And I can also say to all of you out uh, in the internet, part of our, uh, all our internet family out there, you have got to find a place near you where you can fill that hole, a place like this. Joining us on YouTube, uh, it's, it's just not the same, guys. Not the same at all. And we love you guys, and we're happy that you're here, but you need to find a home church near you where you can fill that hole. Now, I have got a question for you guys. Are you ready? Oh, that didn't sound like you were ready. Are you ready? Okay. Who used to play with those little expanding sponge toys? You know what I'm talking about? Yes, I see. I see very smiling faces <laughs> raising their hands very quickly. Okay. Do you remember the ones I'm talking about? Okay. I don't, I don't know if they still exist anymore. Uh, but, but who remembers them? Uh, they, they were the, the greatest things ever. Okay. You, 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 you take them out of the package. And they looked like nothing more than a little plastic pill. Okay? And as I, as I think about it, it was probably not a good idea to be giving kids little things that look like medicine that were not medicine at all. Uh, but <laughs> that's beside the point. Okay? But what did you do with them? What did you do with those little plastic pills? Okay? You'd get some hot water, right? And then you'd throw those babies in the hot water and sit back and watch the miracle begin. Slowly, ever so, yeah, it was before the internet, yes. <laughs> slowly, ever so slowly, the hot water would melt the plastic outer coating, and suddenly, you no longer had a boring little plastic pill sinking in the water. Instead, you had a giant green T-Rex sponge floating on top. Floating on top of that water that just seconds ago was so mundane. Now, I don't know about you, but to a seven-year-old Paul, that was the closest thing to a miracle that I'd ever seen. Okay, one second, I had this boring little pill. The next, I had a T-Rex. Did anybody else have a similar experience? Yeah? They were great, right? And I hope they still exist nowadays. I hope, I hope that it's a little more obvious that they're not medicine. Because uh, <laughs> you really don't want a kid ex ingesting that and having a sponge expanding in their stomach. <laughs> but anyway, I, I hope that they still exist for a very important reason. Okay? Because we may not have known it at the time, but those little miracle sponges... We're teaching us a couple very valuable lessons. 
See, that, that little pill may have just looked like a little pill when you looked at the outer package, but at its heart was a T-Rex. I couldn't see that just by looking at the outside. I had to add the water. So first they taught us not to judge a book by its cover, to not look at the outward appearance of things, but rather to pay attention to the heart. And the other thing they taught us is that big things can come from unassuming and small starts. That green pill didn't look like anything special, but it eventually turned into a dinosaur. So keep that in mind as we look at today's text. You thought I was just going to wax eloquent about sponges, didn't you? You were like, man, Paul has lost a step while he was away. But I have a point, I promise you. So let's dive into the text today, okay? It's found in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 1 to 13. Join me there, and let's see what God has for us this morning. Okay, verse 1 says, Yahweh said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. Okay, so Saul has fallen out of favor with God. He has repeatedly disobeyed God's word, and so God has rejected him as king over Israel. If we are going to be honest here, the writing really was on the wall from the very beginning. Okay? We've seen that Saul never was, nor did he ever become, a godly man. Okay, Saul was going to Saul. He was not chosen because he was this amazingly holy guy. He was exactly what Israel was looking for. They wanted a king just like everybody else, so that's what they got. Okay? He was tall. He was good looking. He was from affluence and influence. He looked like a king. On the outside. But unfortunately, on the inside, he was not kingly or godly material. And so, the inevitable happened. He continued to disobey God, and God finally rejected him as king. And I, I just want to join with Dr. J from last week, okay, and harp on this. If you continue to disobey God's word, you will pay for it. You can try and justify it all you want. You can try and tell me you had no choice, that you were forced to disobey God's word because of the circumstances. You can even try and tell me you disobeyed God's instructions for good, holy reasons. Guess what? Saul tried that too. Didn't work for him. Not going to work for you. No matter what you may think the justification for disobeying God's word is, disobedience will lead to destruction. What you need to do is you need to admit your sin and repent. Repent means go the other way. Here's the deal. Trying to justify your sin in front of a holy God isn't going to work. But there is good news. God is willing to forgive any and every sin. But in order for him to forgive it, it has to be recognized as sin in the first place. So stop trying to justify it. Admit that you disobeyed God's word and accept his forgiveness for it. It's truly the only, the only way for you to be rid of it. Okay? If you decide to try and justify it and continue to try and justify it, you will just be stuck dragging this sin with you everywhere you go. Admit your wrongdoing. Seek forgiveness. Accept the forgiveness. Then, go and sin no more. Now, you might think I'm being mean right now or insensitive here. Okay? Here's the truth of the matter. If I didn't care about you, I wouldn't be saying what I'm saying right now. It is love that gives me the courage and the conviction to be able to stand here and tell you that you need to stop justifying your sin and turn from it. 
If I didn't love you, I'd just leave you to the consequences. So, Saul has been rejected as king. And we find Samuel mourning this. And I've got to tell you, I love Samuel's heart here. Okay? But I also feel kind of bad for him. Okay? I love his heart because of how bothered he is that Saul didn't live up to the standard that he should have. I love his heart because Samuel, no doubt, is worried about the state the nation is in. Their leader has just been rejected by God. What state does that leave the nation of Israel in? Not a good one. Samuel's heart is breaking out of concern for Saul and Israel. And even though this nation and Saul have rejected both Samuel and God as their leader, he still cares deeply for them. But I also feel bad for him because I can't help but feel that Samuel feels at least partially responsible for a great deal of this. After all, it's because of his failure as a father to guide his sons in the ways of the Lord that Israel wanted a king in the first place. At least it was one of the reasons that they gave. And then on top of that, he was unable to successfully serve as an effective religious leader to Saul. I feel Samuel here. Even though most of the blame, if not all of it, can be placed on Saul and his actions, it still hurts when you see someone you've been trying to lead fail to follow your guidance. Samuel has such a leader's heart. He mourns for Saul, the bonehead that wouldn't listen. Okay, but what does God tell him? He says to Samuel, enough belly aching, there is work to do. I've chosen another to lead Israel, and it's your job, Samuel, to go anoint him king. So stop crying over spilled milk and go pour another glass. And let's just stop right there. How often do we find ourselves crying over spilled milk? when God is telling us to go pour another glass? How often do we, do we get caught up in the fact that things didn't work out the way that we wanted them to or the way we thought they should? How often do we sit and mourn and dwell on what could have been when God is telling us to move on to something new? How often do we stew in the offenses that others have caused us in the past? and refuse to move on to more productive things in the future? How often do we stew in those offenses and refuse to see the new thing that God may be doing in that situation? All because we want to cling to those old hurts. Okay? Just hang with me for a second here, because there is a key thing that I don't want you to miss. Notice, it is God that is telling Samuel, to move on. Okay. God's word came to Samuel and told him to move on. See, there is a time to stay and fight, and there is a time to move on. And God's word, the Bible, is our guide to know when we should fight and when we should move. If you find a spirit telling you to move when God's word says to stay, that spirit that is talking to you is not of God. And if you have a spirit telling you to stay when you should move, that spirit is not of God. God's word has to be our guide as it is to Samuel in the text today. God says to Samuel, it's time to move. And what does Samuel say? How can I go if Saul hears about it, he will kill me. Stop. Stop right there. What is Samuel's objection? If I do that, Saul will kill me. He's in fear for his life. Is this a legitimate objection? Well, on one hand, he's probably right. Okay? If Samuel carries out 
what God is asking him to do, it will be tantamount to treason. And Saul will almost definitely kill him. So in that respect, it is legitimate. Right? But if we come at this from a Christian perspective, is death a legitimate reason to object to following God's clear instructions? Well, let me ask you this. Okay? What state would we be in if God sent Jesus down to save us, but in response Jesus said, can't do that, my life will be in danger? We'd be up a creek without a paddle, right? But thankfully, Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, didn't do that. He stayed obedient to God, even to the point of death, even death on a cross, so that we could have eternal life. So, Christian, I ask you again, is the fear of losing your life a legitimate reason to disobey God's clearly revealed instructions to us? Yeah, the answer is no. Now, we don't like that. And we like to use this and even less severe things as an excuse when we are called to boldly follow God. Oh, I can't go down to Planned Parenthood. It's way too dangerous. I can't talk to my friends or, or, or co-workers about Jesus. They might not like me if I do that. I might even get fired. Oh, I can't stay in that relationship. My life might be at risk if I'm in it. None of those excuses, and we could talk about a whole lot more if we had more time, none of those excuses hold any weight for the true Christian who seeks to follow God in the wake of what he did for us through his son, Jesus Christ. Now, what I'm talking about here, this, this radical obedience to God and, and loving sacrificially as Christ loved us is not easy. Okay, it's hard, and it's even harder in our world today that beats it into our brains that priority numero uno must be and should be me and me alone. But if we are truly seeking to be like Christ, which, by the way, is what Christian means, like Christ, if we're se truly seeking to be like Christ, then that means we have to follow his example. Let's look at how God responds to Samuel's objection. Yahweh said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to Yahweh. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. So God says, oh, I'm sorry. You're absolutely right, Samuel. I'm sorry. I didn't even think of that. Just, just forget the whole thing. No. That's not what he says. He tells Samuel, to do it, even though he's risking his life. And then he gives Samuel a way to do it that makes it a little more palatable to Samuel. Okay? Now, here's a question. What if he hadn't done that? What if God hadn't done that? What if he hadn't made a way that was more palatable to Samuel? What if God had simply said to Samuel, look, I know you're afraid, but my will has not changed, and these are my instructions to you. Do them. Would that have let Samuel off the hook? No. And I want to emphasize this. Okay? God did not tell Samuel not to do it. I know that's a double negative. It's confusing. But God did not tell Samuel not to do it. You know why? Because God has got a plan. And Samuel's objections are not going to stop it. And it's a good plan. Okay, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, so hold on to that for a second. But hear me now. Just because we don't like God's word doesn't mean we are then not obligated to follow it. Even if it means that we're putting our lives at risk, God has got a plan, and good will come through obedience to his instructions. And we're going to see that in a second here. Verse 4 says, Samuel did what Yahweh said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, you come in peace? Samuel replied, yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to Yahweh. Consecrate yourselves 
and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. Okay. Praise God, Samuel obeyed. Now it's clear that the tension between Samuel and Saul is known. I mean, when, when, when someone you know, confronts the king in front of everybody and says, listen, God doesn't want you to be king anymore, people hear about it. And people have clearly heard about it. So it is clearly known throughout the land, the tension between the two. So when Samuel arrives, the elders are worried that they're in trouble. But Samuel calms their fears and does as God instructed him to do. Okay, when they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands before Yahweh. But Yahweh said to Samuel, do not consider his outward appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. Yahweh does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but Yahweh looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, Yahweh has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shammah pass by, but Samuel said, nor has Yahweh chosen this one. Jesse had his seven sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, Yahweh has not chosen these. So Jesse and his sons arrive, and when Samuel sees Jesse's oldest, he thinks, ah, I understand now. This, this has got to be the guy. Okay? He looks the part. Surely this is Israel's new king. But God explains to Samuel that outward appearance is not what matters to him. Rather, it's what's in a person's heart. So Elia passes by, and so do all seven of Jesse's sons that are there. And none of them are chosen. Just to be clear, this is weird. By all reason, Eliab should have been the one chosen. Okay? He is the oldest. He even looks the part. And if not Eliab, then at least one of the ones that are there, right? They're there. But it doesn't work out that way. None of Jesse's sons that are there are chosen. And I'm sure Samuel must be somewhat frustrated right now. God sent him to crown a new king, risking his life, and now it looks like it's all for nothing. He's probably wondering, you know, wh what is God on about here? Why did you send me all the way out here to basically commit treason and then not have me actually do it? So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? They're still the youngest, Jesse answered. He's tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. Did you catch it? Did you, I hope you saw it. Did you see it? Okay. Where is Jesse's youngest son? He's out watching the sheep. This is so cool. And if, if you're not paying attention, you will miss it. Hey, because this is the beginning of God setting up David that's Jesse's youngest son, by the way, setting up David to be the antithesis to Saul. Okay, check it out, okay? What do we know about Saul? He's handsome. Okay? He's the oldest son of a wealthy man of influence named Kish. He was tall, and he looked like a king. Okay? When you looked at Saul, you thought, man, that guy looks like a king. That is king material right there. What about David? Okay. David is the youngest son of a lowly shepherd. Not even important enough in his father's eyes to be invited to the banquet with Samuel. This is the really cool part. Where do we first meet Saul? He's sent off by his father to look after some lost donkeys. The flocks of his family are so ill-tended that some of them have gone missing to the point where the oldest son has to go looking for them. What about David? He's faithfully tending the flock. He is a true shepherd, and he'll explain what all that means over his life as we get to know him a little better. 
But suffice to say, he is a good shepherd. And we'll see even more profound differences between the two guys as we go here. But why the differences? Well, God has already told us. Man looks at the outward appearance of things, and what we get are souls. Things that look good on the, on the outside, while the inside, just a big old mess. Meanwhile, God looks at the heart of things. So when the man God has chosen to be king is presented to us, we must see the profound differences in the two. What does that mean? Well, what it means is, when given the choice, go with God's pick. Just in general, he knows better than you and me. He doesn't just see the little green plastic pill. He sees the T-Rex inside. Seriously, it's just so cool to me that when we first meet David, he's already showing us that he is the leader that he needs to be. He is sacrificially staying out in the field to make sure the flock is safe. Not wandering around looking for members of his flock that he should have been protecting in the first place and that have become lost. God knows what he's doing. Verse 12 says, so he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then Yahweh said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of Yahweh came powerfully upon David. Samuel then went to Ramah. And so David's uh, brought before Samuel, and God confirms that this has not been a big waste of time. This is, in fact, the one that God has chosen to be the next king of Israel. And David is anointed then and there in the presence of his brothers. Imagine how they feel right now. Especially Eliab, the oldest. They might not have understood what Samuel was there to do, but after he did it, they must have at least felt slighted in a way. Hey, after all, David is the youngest. This is not how things are supposed to work, Samuel. The oldest is supposed to receive the blessings like this. But David's heart has separated him from the rest. And this will become a point of contention between David and his brothers. And with the task completed, Samuel throws up the deuces and heads back home, back to Rama. But I don't want to lose sight of what's happening here. This is a big moment in history. And I'm not just talking about the history of the nation of Israel. I'm talking about the history of the world. This is God kicking into high gear his plan for the salvation of the world. Because it's out of the line of this lowly shepherd boy that we just met that the Messiah will come. David goes from a lowly shepherd boy to a king to the patriarch of the line that will bring ultimate forgiveness for sin and freedom from death. This is the beginning. See, truly amazing things can come from unassuming packages. Not even David's family believed him to be worthy enough of being at the banquet with Samuel. But God saw David's heart and had unbelievable plans in store. He looked, he looked past that outer plastic shell and saw what was on the inside and knew that something big could come out of that inauspicious little package. So, and what we have to ask ourselves is, what is in David's heart? What is it that separates him from the rest? Well, he's often referred to as a man after God's own heart. But what does that mean? Does it mean that, that David was perfect? No, far from it, and we'll see that. He's not perfect at all. Instead, what it means 
is David is always seeking to revere God's word and obey it. He might not be perfect at that, but that's where his heart lies. So what about you? Where's your heart? Are you a David or are you a Saul? Are you always seeking to live by God's word? Yeah? Even when you don't like it? Even when it means risking your life? Or do you shrink away and only follow his word as far as you see fit to? Only as far as you agree with it? See, David is the one for the nation of Israel in the story. He, he is the one chosen by God to be the new leader of the nation. He is the one God is calling them to follow. But out of his line comes the one we must follow. Jesus Christ. He is the one. He is the one we must follow. He's the example we have to embody. And what was that example? He gave his life for us. And he did that even when we were still lost in our sins. When, when we were still openly declaring hatred and animosity toward him, he died for us. Christian, is that what others see when they look at you? Do they see you following in the steps of Christ and sacrificially laying down your life for the sake of others? Or are you selfishly refusing to follow the one, to not follow the one you say is your Savior? The choice is yours. You can be a Saul. And you can try and justify your disobedience. Or you could be David. And be after God's own heart. Jesus is our example. He's the one we must follow. He is the one.